Good morning, class. Um, today we're going to go through two chapters again, chapter 15 and 16. Uh, I'm actually going to start with chapter 16 and then go to 15 because I like the flow of that a little bit better. Um, as there was last week, there are also a couple of supplement PowerPoints that I'm not going to go through. Maybe I'll just scroll through them quickly, but they just show um, different exercises. And, and that's going to be the focus of today's, of this week's work is learning about exercises, okay? Um, this PowerPoint presentation is not gonna be super long because for your critical thinking assignment, there are a couple exercise technique videos that I'm gonna have you watch and um, just listen to them. The, the, the exercises are done properly, um, but in those videos, they give you some coaching points, common errors, how to get set up, how to execute the exercise, etc. And I want you to uh, pick out that information and, and supply it for the critical thinking assignment because doing an exercise seems simple, but you know, as, as a coach, there are a lot of specific things you want to look for to make sure that your athlete is doing the exercise properly uh, and safely. Okay, so to kick it off, then part of doing an exercise properly and safely is getting set up properly. You know, before you even do any movement, you want to have the body in what we see here, um, known as a stable body position. Now that position is going to be different depending upon the type of exercise that you're doing, right? If you're doing a, um, a freestanding exercise, your two points of contact are your feet, obviously. Okay. So how do you position your feet in order to be stable? Typically we say that your shoulder, sorry, your feet should be slightly wider than shoulder width, right? You want to give yourself a good wide base from which to produce force, okay? Um, a narrow base is going to make you less stable and you can produce less force when you're less stable. So in order to produce more force and to do it safely, having a wider base can help you uh, accomplish that. Um, there may also be situations where uh, you want to stagger your feet slightly as well, okay? Um, honestly, feet even is less stable than slightly staggered. Okay. Now in some exercises, such as a back squat or a deadlift, you're going to have your feet even. Okay. Um, but for upper body exercises done from a standing position, you often want to have the feet staggered um, because you're going to be able to push and pull more efficiently and more, with more stability if your feet are staggered versus if your feet are even. Okay. So again, Depending upon the exercise, you may want to have an even foot stance or a staggered foot stance, but in, in almost all cases, the shoulder width distance between the feet is going to be a good go-to um, stance, okay? Another thing that is not listed here is what we call the athletic stance. Uh, an athletic stance is simply another, I'm trying, just trying to think if there's like another word or phrase that is used for that and that is a triple extension or triple sort of finishing with triple extension the point is is that in an athletic stance you have your hips knees and ankles all slightly flexed right so you're not standing tall with your joints locked you are sort of in like a, an eighth or a quarter squat position uh, that also is a good position to be in for stability okay now, um, you may also do supine exercises, which are exercises done on your back, such as a bench press. Um, in these, a stable position is usually defined as one that has five points of contact, okay? So what are those five points? Um, well, we have the two feet, just like we did when we're standing, but we're then gonna add other points of contact that are in contact with the bench, okay? So usually it's gonna be your hips or your glutes, your upper back, uh, and then your head. So those are the five points of contact that you should have when you're do doing a bench press exercise or other supine exercises, supine meeting uh, laying on your back, okay? So once we move past the body position, then we might wanna consider um, what is the appropriate grip. So if we're using a barbell exercise or doing a barbell exercise, what type of grip do we wanna have, okay? And again, that's gonna be based upon the exercise you're performing. <clears throat> We'll get to some specifics of grip here in just a second. Let's just carry on with a couple more of these um, general guidelines. 
for breathing, typically it is recommended that you exhale do, during the more difficult portion of the lift, which is often identified as the concentric portion. So again, if I'm just going to use a bench press as an, as an example. The more strenuous portion of a bench press is when you're lifting the weight off your chest. Okay, so in order to minimize um, a lot of intra-abdominal pressure being created, you would exhale, blow out during the concentric portion, and then you inhale during the eccentric portion. Okay, so blow out in the concentric, blow up, suck in during the eccentric. Okay. Um, now there are situations where you may want to uh, sort of hold your breath, such as when you're coming up out of a squat or out of a deadlift, right? Creating that intra-abdominal pressure that you can create by holding your breath. And that's, that's that Valsalva maneuver that we've talked about before. That actually helps enhance stability of your lumbar spine, which is important for doing exercises that load the lumbar spine, such as the back squat and, and the deadlift, right? And those are things that typically are done with very heavy loads. So stabilizing the lumbar spine is of particular importance in those situations. <clears throat> and that is what this second bullet point on this slide is going to talk about. When you are doing these very heavy loads, greater than 80% of your one rep max, that it is useful to create that spinal stability using the Valsalva maneuver, which is basically, you're gonna basically think about this, you're keeping your mouth closed, but you're gonna blow out, but because your mouth is closed, air cannot come out, so you're creating sort of like this pressure ball in your abdominal cavity that helps stabilize that lumbar spine and helps keep it from flexing or extending. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about body weight training. Uh, we're going to go through some different types of training uh, in these couple in these PowerPoints here. Body weight training has a lot of benefit, right? Um, it can be used in many different situations. Uh, it can be used as part of a warm up. So when we looked at the dynamic dynamic warm up last week, there were things like lunges, push ups, body weight squats. So they're good to use for warm up exercises for sure. Okay, but they can also be used for conditioning as well. So doing like a lot of reps in a short period of time, that's pretty common as well. Um, I guess one thing I do want to mention is always consider if body weight is appropriate for a given individual. The key is to load the muscle appropriately. Okay. Some people who may have very low body weight, their body weight might not be enough to give their muscles sufficient stimulus to promote adaptation. So you might need to do external loading with dumbbells or barbells. Now on the other side of the spectrum, obese individuals, um, their body weight might be in too much of an overload and they may not be able to safely and effectively move their body weight against gravity, right? So just think about um, an obese individual may have a hard time doing a push up, right? So in that case, the push up, the body weight is too high of a load so you might need to use dumbbells to reduce the load, right? So maybe they're doing like 15 pound dumbbells in each hand for a, a dumbbell bench press instead of doing a push up because the, their body weight is too high. Okay, so always consider that. What is the body mass of the individual look like? And is that an appropriate training load when you're considering using um, body weight exercises? Okay. <clears throat> Another type of training is what is known as core training. Okay, now that term sort of has, has a lot of different uses. Uh, in, the, in the strength and conditioning community, and that's what the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, sort of falls on, in under, and that organization wrote this textbook. So they often use the word core exercises to refer to squat, deadlift, and bench press, sort of the exercises that make up the foundation of any strength and conditioning program. Now, other people, other organizations, um, and in the fitness community, I would say, they tend to use the word core to refer to abdominal training, okay? So I think that maybe a way to differentiate it is if you see the term core stability, that is referring to the abdominal area. And what we're talking about with stability is stability of the lumbar spine. As you probably know, the lumbar spine is an area that is often injured with people. 
through many different activities. Okay, so training the muscles around the lumbar spine or the, the, the abdominal muscles and the low back muscles to be able to contract and create stability is a good way to protect against low back injury uh, and actually a way to recover from it as well. Okay. So there are different, um, the, the anatomical focus of that type of training, core stability training is again to train the muscles that do surround the lumbar spine. Okay. <clears throat> and that's what the anatomical core is referring to that core area of the body. I'm just going to stand up and show you basically, this area of the body, right? So your rectus abdominis, hip flexors, transverse abdominis, the obliques, um, even the erector spinae. You basically have this, um, this almost, it's like a weight belt that's inside your body that surrounds your abdominal area. And we wanna get used to producing force there and stabilizing that area when we're doing exercises, right? You might have heard coaches say, engage your core Right, and really when you're doing anything, you should engage your core. Especially the big exercises like the squat and the deadlift. Very, very important, okay? But really all exercises in my opinion. You can create more stability overall if you create core stability by engaging those muscles. Stability goes up and you should be able to produce more force uh, by doing that in both the upper and lower extremities, okay? Now, another type of exercise um, you might hear referred to are isolation exercises. Typically, those are in contrast to, to multi-joint. So multi-joint exercises involve several muscles, multiple joints being used. A good example of that is the squat, right? Your hips, knees, ankles are all flexing and extending. That's a multi-joint exercise. You're gonna recruit more muscle mass using those types of exercises. Bench press is another one, shoulder and elbow, so multi-joint in action. An isolation exercise, on the other hand, is one that uses one single joint, okay? So a bicep curl is the best example there. Only the elbow, right? And you could have both elbows, it's still one joint, is what that's referring to. Only a single joint is in motion, so that's gonna be an isolation exercise. Less muscle mass is recruited versus a multi-joint. So typically athletes, they're going to rely mostly on multi-joint exercises because sports involve multiple joints. There's very few sports where a muscle is used in isolation. Now that does not mean you should never use isolation exercises, but the foundation of your training programs should always be multi-joint exercises. Um, isolation exercises can be sort of like on the periphery. They may also be used for corrective exercises as well. So if you have an injured muscle, you might need to do some isolation work on that specific muscle to get it back up to its non-injured state. Um, now we could use machines versus free weights, right? Um, now machines, oops, sorry about that. The good news is, is they provide stability. Okay. Um, however, you want to train stability, okay? And if the machine is providing the stability, then the body is not going to be stimulated to provide the stability, okay? So in my opinion, athletes especially should do almost exclusively free weight exercises, okay? Now you might use machines at times, like a leg press, okay? But for the most part, free weights are going to, as we see here, they're going to cause greater activation of stabilizer muscles um, and they're going to simulate more like what occurs on the field versus a machine, right? Usually with machines, you're sitting down when you do the exercise. Um, there are very few sports where you're ever sitting down, right? So there's not a lot of transfer over to the real world application when you're using machines. But with some populations like elderly populations, um, novice populations, they might learn the pattern with the machine and then you progress them to free weights where they're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit more challenging for them. With machines, the range of motion is fixed where with free weights, it's not fixed, okay? So again, for, for novices, that fixed range of motion can be good just to get them started and then you slowly transition them uh, to free weights, okay? 
<clears throat> unstable devices I'm not really going to talk about too much um, but these are things like you know like doing exercises on one of the big exercise balls or on the basu ball um, those can improve stability increase muscle activation but again there's not a lot of transfer to athletics because in almost all sports you're performing on a stable surface versus an unstable you know the only one i can think of that's unstable is maybe like ice hockey but even still the surface is not moving it's just really slippery okay so it's tempting i think to get creative and use some of these unstable surfaces to do training on however the research does not really back up the fact that they improve performance in the sport itself. Always remember that principle of specificity, okay? Whenever you're training for a sport, simulate the conditions that exist in that sport, and then the carryover will be more, um, will be larger. So key point, take a second to read that one. I'm not gonna go through it again because I've already, already been talking for longer than I wanted to to keep this PowerPoint short, but I tend to do that sometimes. These are some other um, ways you can load, you know, like a constant external resistance is going to be a dumbbell or barbell. What that's referring to is that the load is not going to change, right? And that makes sense. If you're using a 50 pound dumbbell, it's going to weigh 50 pounds the whole way through the range of motion. So most resistance training that we do is constant external resistance, okay? Another type of resistance is known as accommodating, and that's where the load changes through the range of motion. Now that can only be done through a specialized machine. Um, it does not really occur in free weight or um, gym type environments. So I'm gonna skip past that one because it doesn't really apply to this class much. Variable resistance. Now this is something that is used sometimes. We can actually do that using primarily two methods, um, either bands or chains, okay? So think about a bench press exercise again. And let's imagine that you have um, big heavy chains attached to both ends of the barbell, okay? Now, if you start at the bottom, a lot of the chain is gonna be on the floor, okay? But as you lift the barbell off your chest, more of the chain is going to be lifted off the floor so that barbell is going to get heavier the farther away from the floor that you get it okay we could also do this with a squat right um so that's a way to make the resistance increase as you increase the range of motion uh, you can also do this with bands right let's imagine the same situation you have a a barbell you're going to start low often you're going to need a spotter for this type of activity and you have some heavy resistance bands attached to each end of the barbell as you push the barbell off your chest that band is going to be stretched so the resistance is going to increase as you move away from your body okay <clears throat> both of these are more advanced methods of loading okay so again with novices you always start simple but if you have an experienced athlete or you yourself, I would encourage you all, if you train regularly, you know, experiment with this type of stuff because it's just interesting to do it and kind of see how it works. Um, but make sure in both of these situations that I just talked about, have a spotter with you because you're more likely to get injured if you're by yourself doing these types of things than you would be just doing sort of a, a regular type of exercise. With both of these, Notice this bullet point here. The highest load is experienced at the top position because either the band is stretched more or you have more of that chain uh, lifted off the floor. <clears throat> and here's a better description of the chain uh, supplemented exercises. So take a second to read those and I'm going to move on to the next slide. So then we can also use what are known as non traditional implements for training. Uh, these would be things such as tires, logs, kettlebells, right? These are things that are typically associated with what is known as a strongman training. So if you've ever been flipping through your sports channels on TV at late at night, you might see these strongman competitions uh, and they're kind of interesting to watch. Um, but these have actually gained popularity in <clears throat> fitness training as well like with boot camps, fitness classes, where instructors are always trying to find kind of new and novel things for their, for their clients to do. Strongman training has been incorporated um, 
quite a bit more. And it's incorporated in the in the strength and conditioning community as well. And when I say strength and conditioning community, <clears throat> what I'm referring to again are the training of athletes. Fitness, regular people, strength and conditioning is athletes. This class is geared towards athletes, so that's who I refer to most of the time when I'm giving these lectures. Here are some examples of um, kettlebells. I'm sure by this point in your life you have seen these. Um, <clears throat> I will say that you want to learn how to use these, right? I see a lot of people use these improperly. The kettlebell swing is kind of like the, the most popular exercise you would do with this device, but they're often done wrong. So find a reputable source on YouTube maybe to watch to learn how to do a kettlebell swing. Um, this particular device was first used in Russia. So if you Google like Russian kettlebell training, <clears throat> you're going to find good information on how to use kettlebells for swings and things of that nature. Not only do they build strength, <clears throat> but they can also build cardiovascular fitness as well, especially using the, the Russian style of training. Uh, now I'm going to finish with discussion of uh, unilateral training. So this is very important. <clears throat> unilateral is going to refer to single limb. Bilateral refers to double limb. Okay. Now, both limbs can be doing the same thing. The key is, are they doing the same thing at the same time? So, for example, in a, in a back squat, <clears throat> both feet are even. And they're doing the same thing at the same time. Both legs are flexing and extending at the same time. So a squat or a deadlift, uh, those are examples of a, a, a bilateral exercise. And uh, a bench press is as well because both hands, both arms, they're doing the same thing at the same time. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, a unilateral is more traditionally thought of as a single leg or single arm exercise. However, that doesn't just mean that only one foot or one hand is in contact with the floor or whatever device you're using. Because <clears throat> if you think about something like a lunge, when you're doing a lunge, you have both feet still on the ground, but each leg is doing something different. Okay, so that's a good definition of a unilateral exercise. You might be using both legs, but each leg is doing something different. Okay, so a lunge, a split squat, um, a rear foot elevated split squat, uh, a single leg Romanian deadlift. Those are all good examples of unilateral exercises. Um, as far as upper body, you know, it's a little more gray area. If you're doing it, imagine I have two dumbbells in my hand. If I'm doing both dumbbells pressing together, technically that's a bilateral exercise. But if I'm doing a single arm alternating dumbbell bench press, where my arms are doing different things at the same time, that is more an example of a unilateral exercise, okay? So in general, you wanna always include both in a strength and conditioning program, okay? In athletics, again, you use both bilateral and unilateral activity pretty commonly, like right when you're jumping to get a rebound or any sort of jump in most sports, that's going to be bilateral. But technically running is more of a unilateral, right? And lunging that you do in different sports, that's unilateral. Same thing with the arms. You know, throwing is more unilateral, but throwing like a chest pass is bilateral. So you want to use, you want to incorporate both types of training in your um, training programs. Now, this, this term here, the bilateral deficit, refers to the fact that let's say that Going back to the dumbbell bench press, I'm just going to throw out an example. When I'm doing a dumbbell bench press, I can only move, I can only use 50 pound dumbbells in each hand, okay, which would total to 100 pounds. But when I do a barbell bench press, I can move 185, right, which would divide it in half be um, 90.5 pounds in each hand, right? 
So that those don't equal each other. And that's what the bilateral deficit refers to. The fact that you're stronger bilaterally than you are unilaterally, unilaterally. Okay. Same thing with like a squat. You could do a barbell back squat for with 300 pounds maybe, but you can't do a lunge with 150 pounds, right? So there's a deficit that exists. Um, that also speaks to why you want to use both types of training. If you only use unilateral, then you're going to be limiting your force production because you could lift much more bilaterally, okay? Now, I did these PowerPoints backwards, um, so just remember this: these are our tasks. Um, the critical thinking assignment is, is different this week. I'll come back and talk about that, but let me quickly go to chapter 15. This one will go a lot faster, um, I promise. So these are going to be some more um, specific lifting basics that we'll go through um, kind of quickly. Okay. So gripping, I mentioned this in the last PowerPoint. Um, this is this is mostly only going to apply if you're doing barbell training. Okay. So different types of grips, uh, pronated grip. Um, this is where your palms are going to be down, right? So overhand grip is what that is called. Okay. Um, a supinated grip is known as an underhand grip okay now most bar but like a barbell bench press you're always going to do that pronated okay but something like a pull-up you may use both pronated and supinated okay um an alternating grip is not listed here but an alternating grip is where one hand is pronated one hand is supinated i don't know if you all can see that let me try to move my hands okay your actually strongest grip is an alternating grip. So a lot of times people who deadlift, they will use an alternating grip because you'll have one hand overhanded, one hand underhanded. You actually get a much stronger grip that way than just pronated or just supinated. Okay. Uh, a neutral grip is then one where your palms are facing each other. You know, things like, um, some pulling exercises like the the seated row machine or you could even do pull-ups with a neutral grip if you have the um, proper type of pull-up bar that's pretty common as well um, in general like i mentioned with bilateral and unilateral training uh, you want to mix up your grip as well right any way you can vary the stimulus that your muscles are getting is good changing your grip periodically will bury the stimulus a little bit so it's always good to kind of mix your grips up but always use the grip that is the most appropriate for certain exercises for a deadlift the alternating grip is appropriate for a bench press the pronated grip is appropriate um, personally i like to do chin-ups which is palms facing your body which is the supinated grip so mix it up play with each uh, but make sure that you're doing it safely okay um, here actually is the alternated grip described and then the hook grip is one where let me see if I can show you this Where's my camera? Instead of wrapping your thumb around the bar You're gonna kind of do it like this, okay, so this is something that can be used as well um, some power lifters in the bench press will use the hook grip You want to go gently with this one because obviously the bar could slide out the thumb being around the bar keeps it locked in but if you're using the hook grip there's nothing to keep that bar from moving that direction so always want to use that one um, with caution it is appropriate with certain exercises though and then um, here we have some pictures of the different grips in case you were a little bit confused Pronated is overhand, supinated is underhand. The alternating grip is shown here, and then I don't actually agree that this is the hook grip. I think that's a bad picture. The thumb should not be wrapped. No, maybe it's just the way the view looks, though. That could be it. Okay. <clears throat> alternating grip, I think, does give you the best ability to hold on to a bar. So when you're picking up something very heavy off the ground, the alternating grip is gonna give you the most strength. I think that's a lecture study question, so make a note of that. That's why I have a star there. Okay, um, grip widths. So another thing is how wide do you want your grip to be, okay? Again, this is something you might manipulate. This is kind of another advanced manipulation technique. 
as I mentioned earlier, any way you can manipulate the stimulus on your muscles is going to be good, a good thing. So moving your grip closer together or wider is another way to do that. Okay. <clears throat> for most exercises and for novices, you're always going to start with sort of that shoulder width. That's always a good go-to. That's what's referred to as the common width. Okay. Um, but you know, for people who are looking to really build their, their chest muscles, the conventional wisdom is when you have a narrow grip on the bar, you, you work the inner part of the chest more. And when you have that wider grip, you work the outer part of the chest more. So <clears throat> for somebody who's trying to get really good at the bench press exercise, using all three of the grip widths is going to be the recommended thing to do. But for most people, the, the common shoulder width grip is going to be kind of your go-to and the thing you'll use most often. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. I think allergies are kicking in. It's March. That tends to happen. Um, now, as far as positioning, we already touched on this a little bit in the past PowerPoint. Let me just see if there's anything on this slide that's different from that. Um, there really isn't, but I guess I'll just reiterate <clears throat> that your limbs are going to be more stable if your torso is stable. When you're laying on your back, your torso is stable. If you're standing, you stabilize your torso by activating your core, like I talked about in the last uh, PowerPoint. So watch this. You, you engage your core by doing what I call the posterior tilt. So if I squeeze my abdominals, tuck my hips in, that activates my glutes, abs are nice and tight, that's gonna stabilize my entire torso and increase my ability to produce force safely and reduce my risk of having a low back injury. Okay. So engaging the core is always going to be a good way to create a stable body, really regardless if you're doing uh, an exercise on your back or standing. I still do that engagement of the core when I'm doing supine exercises too, because really that should become like an automatic thing that you do. Whenever you're about to do any sort of exercise, engage your core, right? Make it just a reflex. Um, that's going to make you really better at doing exercises, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Okay, um, here we go through the this, this positioning again. Um, as I talk, I don't know why these two chapters have so much um, sort of common material, um, but as I mentioned earlier, for standing, slightly wider than hip width is going to be the good um, foot position, and then... When you're seated or supine, you want to have that five-point five point contact position. Again, to review that, one foot, two foot, hips, upper back, head. Those are your five points of contact. Uh, and those are listed here. I've had some coffee, so I'm getting ahead of myself because my mind is working five steps ahead. Which is not a bad thing, but it does tend to get annoying at times, so I apologize. Okay, um, range of motion and speed. Now, typically, it's always good to do all exercises through a full range of motion, okay? Joints <clears throat> are kept healthy when they are able to move through their full range of motion without any um, pain or discomfort or excessive tightness. The way that you reduce joint pain is by making sure joints are moved through their full range of motion, okay? So most of your training should be done through a full range of motion. Now, again, there might be certain situations where you do work through a limited range of motion. Okay. And that's okay. A good example is, you know, jumping, right? In, in athletics, you never do a full squat to jump, right? When you jump to get a rebound or to hit a volleyball, you jump from more of a quarter squat position versus a full squat position. So that is a good example of when you could train doing squat jumps from the quarter squat position because that has the most translation to what you do in your sport. Okay, so there are situations where the limited range of motion training is, is good and recommended, but for kind of your average fitness people, average population for them, I like to exclusively, almost exclusively use full range of motion. Okay, now speed is another thing that's interesting. Um, that's gonna vary based upon the experience level of the person. For a novice who's never lifted weights before, usually slow and controlled in both phases of the range of motion is going to be good, okay? 
However, once they have progressed and they're more advanced, typically it's good to do the eccentric portion slow and then an explosive or rapid concentric portion, okay? That's going to stimulate the muscle the most and pr produce the highest level of adaptation. Now, for an athlete, you want to maybe do rapid eccentric and concentric because, again, it goes to, in athletics, success is often predicated on, upon producing force rapidly, right? You want to be as fast as possible no matter what you're doing. So training rapidly, you know, if you want to be fast, you have to train fast. So again, that's more of an advanced loading technique, which you would use with athletes moving rapidly through both phases of the range of motion. Uh, but with novices, slow in both phases for hypertrophy, slow eccentric, rapid concentric, and then for athletes, mix in rapid eccentric and rapid concentric. Uh, breathing, we've already touched on this one as well a little bit. Um, exhale through the sticking point. That was what I kind of mentioned last chapter was in the concentric phase. I, I keep using the bench press because that's the easiest for me to do on camera. But if I lower that bar, I'm inhaling and then I'm, I'm at a sticking point. I would exhale at that sticking point. Exhale through the most um, stressful phase of the repetition, inhale during the less stressful phase of the repetition. Usually the eccentric phase is the less stressful. That's the lengthening portion. The concentric phase or the shortening, that is the most stressful. So usually you're gonna exhale during that phase. We've already talked about the Valsalva maneuver, but again, that can enhance lumbar stability so during exercises such as the squat or the deadlift when you're coming up off the floor holding your breath can actually help enhance that lumbar stability and um, further reduce your risk of injuring yourself you can also enhance core stability by wearing a weight belt now you don't want to rely on this all the time um, so here's some kind of checkpoints about when you would want to do it and when not to, right? If, if you're not stressing the lower back, there's absolutely no reason to do it. Um, but if you are, and especially if somebody has an existing back issue, they are the most likely candidates to wear a weightlifting belt when they're doing things like squats and deadlifts. Um, but in general, I think you want to train the body to create that stability versus using a weight belt to do it. All right, we're going to finish up by talking about spotting. I believe this is our last topic, okay? Um, spotting is important. It's going to vary based upon the equipment you're using, the exercise you're doing. You know, typically machines do not um, require spotters. Um, power lifts also are not going to use spotters because that's just kind of dangerous. Um, spotters are typically used in the following conditions uh, that you see here um, if the bar is being moved overhead or over the chest or it's passing over the face um, anytime there's a danger of somebody dropping weight on themselves you would use a spotter okay for novices you're always going to typically use a spotter at least you, you want to be in position to help them that's a good way um, to kind of look at it i think um, for somebody who's doing a bench press, you know, I may not um, have my hands on the bar at all times, but I'm going to be in the ready position. And if I see them start to struggle, I can reach down and grab that bar pretty quickly. Okay. You may require multiple spotters. Um, if somebody's doing a maximal bench press, um, it's recommended to have three spotters, one at the head of the bench and then one on either end of the bar. Okay. Um, because the load might be too heavy for the single spotter to assist with, you know, so that's another consideration as well. Make sure that your spotter is uh, sufficiently strong enough to help you. Although in most cases, as a spotter, you're not lifting the entire load off the person. You're just giving them a little bit of assistance in most cases. Okay. Um, I think that covers that pretty well. You know, just some other considerations, like if you're using a squat rack, um, before you start the exercise, make sure that you've adjusted the power rack, um, crossbars and things to be at the appropriate height for you. Okay. Um, when you're racking a squat, if you're doing a barbell back squat and you're racking it, you shouldn't have to go up on your tippy toes 
to get it on the safety supports, you should be able to just squat down slightly. Okay. When you, when you get the bar off the rack, you should have to duck down just slightly to get the bar on your back. And then when you stand up tall, it should lift the bar off and then you can walk straight back and you're free and clear. Okay. But again, these are things when you have a barbell on your back, there's more likely to be an injury if somebody does not know what they're doing. So you should always practice things first before you are in the position of training another person or spotting another person. Know what it feels like from the first side before you go to the other side and, and start to work with it. And when you're learning these things, make sure you have somebody there to teach you or a spotter who has some experience uh, that can help you. Over the face, you know, again, that's going to be a, a situation where you want to have uh, a spotter available um, to help you. Here are some pictures that show um, incorrect versus correct. So the correct spotting position when somebody's doing a, a barbell bench press, or sorry, a dumbbell bench press, is to be able to grab the wrists and sort of pull them up versus pushing from the elbows, okay? Number of spotters I've already kind of touched off, um, touched on. You know, communication is good. Make sure you work out with the person, you know, about how many reps they think they're going to do. Um, you as the spotter can ask them, do you want me to help you with lift off? Because they may not want help with lift off, right? So I always ask, do you want help with lift off? If they say yes, then you do it. If they say no, you don't. Have an idea of how many reps they're trying uh, and then know maybe communicate with them. Like, when do you want me to jump in? Do you want me to jump in right away? Do you want me to give you like um, half a second of failure and then jump in? Just have that discussion before the exercise starts. Um, that's gonna, again, allow for a safer situation. Okay, so that is it with that. Um, I wanted to just quickly show you the supplement PowerPoints. Um, so the chapter 15 supplement is gonna show just a lot of different exercises. Um, exercises have different names, right? Depending upon the person that you're talking to. I think my recording might have froze up. <laughs> 